Welcome. Welcome to the 2014 annual conference and specifically to the laity session. If you could, fo if you folks could be seated and you can, and so we can get started, you can sit anywhere that you wish throughout this auditorium for now. When we get back into the plenary sessions, you have to be within the voting bar and that will be explained as part of the introduction to the, uh, the plenary sessions. My name is John Kinesny. A lot of folks know me as John K or JK. I am the conference lay leader with the Susquehanna Annual Conference. That's a mouthful. I'm going to have to work on that. I work closely with the bishop and the cabinet and the conference staff and leaders across the conference in order to empower, equip, and engage laity in, in raising up ministry and mission throughout the conference. Over the next two hours, we have an agenda that's planned which will highlight important information that you should take back and share with your churches, as well as to help navigate your way through conference here the next several days, particularly if this is your first time. We will be starting with a short devotion today and centering time before we have presentations dealing with different aspects of raising up transformational leaders. We'll be also having an informational session about the conference response team. And then finally, we'll be having a time of community building so that we get to know one another, at least some of us get to know one another here at the conference. So right now, please stand if you're able for the call to worship. Where is the word of God? 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 We'll now have an Old Testament scripture reading from Exodus 33. Moses said to the Lord, Look, you've been telling me, lead these people forward, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. Yet you've assured me, I know you by name and I think highly of you. Now, if you do think highly of me, show me your ways that I may know you and so that you may really approve of me. <coughs> Remember too that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, I'll go myself and I'll help you. Moses replied, if you won't go yourself, don't make us leave here, because how will anyone know that we have your special approval, both I and your people, unless you go with us? Only that distinguishes us, me and your people, from every other people on the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I'll do exactly what you've asked, because you have my special approval, and I know you by name. Let us now come to the God in a word of prayer. Most holy God, we are a people who need you in your fullness as creative father, redeeming son, and sustaining spirit. Our lives have complications and pain. Our world has conflict and confusion. But we were made in your image and your spirit was breathed into us that we may experience hope in your goodness and peace in your leadership. Lord, just as you did with Moses, you have called us to lead your people forward. Just as you did with Moses, you have promised to show us your ways to go with us as we lead your people and to know us each by name. Lord, as we are entering this 2014 Susquehanna Annual Conference, we, as lay members you have called, Lift up our concerns to you now in the silence of our hearts. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father 
I've made known to you. You did not choose me, I chose and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. For our centenary time today, I'd like to first credit Sermon Spice and Max Lucado for the inspirations that they brought to me on uh, what I'd like to share with you. When you came in, I didn't think, you probably didn't think that you'd be taking a pop quiz, but I'm gonna give one anyway. In your mind, name the 10 wealthiest people in the world. No, 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 you, in your mind. <laughs> Okay, how about the last 10 Academy Award winners for Best uh, uh, Actress? Okay, here's an easier one. The last decade's worth of World Series winners, and I'll give you a hint. My Pittsburgh Pirates aren't one of them. <laughs> Probably you didn't do that well, and I, I surely didn't whenever I first took this quiz. It's surprising how we forget about these things. And these are no second-rate achievements. These were the top in their field. Here's another quiz. This one in your mind, again. See how you do on this one. Think of three people you enjoy spending time with. Name five people that have taught you something worthwhile, again, in your mind. How about five friends who've helped you in a difficult time? Easier? Yeah. It was easy for me, too. The lesson here is that people who make a difference to us are not the ones with the most credentials. They're not necessarily the top achievers in their field. It's the ones in our mind and in God's who have the right heart. Final quiz. This is the final test. And you should all pass this one. This is a real easy one. If you were launching a spiritual revolution, a worldwide outreach based on love, integrity, character, compassion, who would you choose for your leaders? Who would you choose for this important endeavor? Would you choose the spiritual somebodies of the day? Or would you have raised up leaders such as fishermen, pessimists, white collar criminals, braggarts, terrorists? From a world's perspective, not exactly the all-star lineup you would expect to cry, for Christ to choose. They were ordinary, diverse, raw, untamed, imperfect, not one a public speaker, not formally trained, and they were all small town men. Look at the writer of 1 Corinthians. What he, when he was called, what was he doing? He was actively arresting and persecuting Christians, those already called by Christ. So what did Christ see in all these people? Christ views each and every person as one of equal value. There's no pecking order in Christ's world. It's not the credentials that are significant to Jesus. We are all significant to Jesus. No one is better than another. D.L. Moody once said, we may be easily too big for God to use, but never too small. All Christ asked is that we be obedient to his call on our life. So let's fast forward 2,000 years into the future and look at God, who God calls today. Just look around the room, look, at, look in this room. He's called all of us in this room. 
Think about each of our own roots. Where have we come from? Think back when you were younger. Did you think about those things that you've accomplished so far in your life? Many of them you probably wouldn't have envisioned when you were young. When you look at your life today, does your early vision of your life compare favorably to that? Or is it even better than what you had originally envisioned? Remember this, God is not as much concerned with our ability as he is with our availability. God is pleased when we're willing to use what we have to serve, regardless of how unskilled we think we are. As we look forward to this coming year and our annual conference theme, which you can see up there and, and, and up here, is Alive in Christ Together, Raising Up Transformational Leaders. I would ask that each of you prayerfully ask God to help each one of us to understand what leadership step each one of us needs to take. To help each of us perceive those potential leaders as God does and not as the world does. To help each of us better understand his vision of transformational leadership for this annual conference. To help each of us see his vision of those people he wants us to reach out to and to help each of us see those ways that he wants us to raise up and equip those leaders. <clears throat> As you've probably seen for the last several months, the theme for this year's annual conference is Alive in Christ Together, Raising Up Transformational Leaders. The next portion of this session will be about just two ways the conference is working to raise up those transformational leaders. Our next presenter will be discussing how laity are being called and raised up to be transformational clergy leaders. Carol Diffenbaugh serves as on the board of Ordained Ministry where she is the co-chair of the Enlistment and Interpretation Committee. She also serves on the Harrisburg District Committee on Ordained Ministry and she's a certified lay speaker. Carol's on staff at Aldersgate United Methodist Church in Hamden Township for the past 12 years serving as the Director of Health and Nurture Ministries. Carol? Good morning. I am delighted to be here on behalf of the Enlistment and Interpretation Committee of the Board of Ordained Ministry. Our role is to help individuals discern how God has called them to serve as a disciple of Christ. We assist individuals claiming God's call upon them. And, and for some of you, that may be a form of lay leadership or lay ministry, perhaps as a lay servant or a certified lay minister, a Sunday school teacher, an usher, um, or perhaps in a vocation such as um, a mechanic, a teacher, a doctor. God calls us in so many ways. For others, this may be serving the church in the role as an ordained elder, an ordained deacon, or perhaps as a local pastor. God calls all of the baptized. Well, people, that's all of us. And if God is calling us to serve, should we be more intentional in listening to God and saying, God, what do you have planned for me? If you ask the people of your church right now, could they say, I think this is what God has planned for me. Hmm, leadership in the church, transformational leadership. To me, I'm really excited about this annual conference, about what I can learn in the next few days from people far wiser than I, letting us know What's a transformational leader? How can we bring up people to be transformational leaders? And you know what? As interested as I am, there's a whole world out there that's interested in this. All you have to do is listen to the TV news or read a newspaper, and you hear the media always challenging, either it's local or national or international leaders. They're questioning things like, did they exemplify leadership quality? or? Did they respond as a world leader should? Or the one that I like most is, did they have the right answers? 
When did they have that answer? Is this answer correct? They're really focused on the leaders having the correct answers at the right time. Well, I don't blame them. The world's sort of a mess right now. We live in a broken world. But the interesting thing about that is that there's this website that uh, it's called the Lewis Center for Church Leadership. It's out of Wesley Seminary. And on its site, it always has this quote, which always makes me think when I hear the world saying that leaders need to have the right answers, they need to have them now. But according to the Lewis Center for Church Leadership, it says leaders do not need the answers, but they need to know the right questions. Hmm. You see, I do think the world is looking for leaders. They're desperately looking for leaders because the world's broken. The problem is, is I think the leaders that the world are looking for or towards are not going to have the answer to fix their brokenness. I think the church already knows and has had the model of the perfect leader, Christ. Christ modeled for us what leadership is all about. And, and if you look in Matthew 20:28, 20, it tells us that the Son of God came not to be served, but to serve. Hmm. Christ came to serve, and leaders are supposed to have the right questions. So I propose that maybe the questions the leaders need to have is, God, how am I to serve you? I think that God has called each and every one of you today here. When we talk about leadership in the church, well, guess what, people? You're part of that. God brought you here. And God has a purpose and a reason for you being here today and also has a plan how you are to serve God. I think it's time for our church to take serious this question. God, how am I to serve you? Not only are we to take that question seriously and ask God, what are your plans for me? But do I have the faith to take that first step and follow your calling in serving you as you call me? Lovett Weems says that, lo that leadership is possible only through the power of God. It begins with prayerful discernment by a leader to what is God calling us now? To what is God calling us to now? Well, guess what? Encapsulated, the E&I team, that's exactly what our purpose is here for is to help you individually answer that question, to have that discernment journey with God saying, okay, God, what are your plans for me now? We have several events that, um, and opportunities for people to help you with your discernment process. Um, if the people who click the, there we go, it's called the God's Call event. The next one's going to be on August 16th. It's going to be up in Williamsport, First United Methodist Church. It's for a college age and older. We've had these events for several years, and I can honestly say, I still to this day get people who email me and say, I'm so grateful we went, I went to this event. This helped start the dialogue. This helped me with my call. I've never heard someone say to me, it was a waste of time or I shouldn't have come. Now, I don't think that has anything to do with what we do, but I do believe it's God's Holy Spirit blessing us with having fruitful dialogue at a time and a meeting. It's one day. We will discuss lay ministry, but we will also discuss the ordained ministry. Elders and deacons and local pastors will talk about God's calling. I really encourage you to come. If you happen to know someone who's in the candidacy process, this is a requirement for certification, and soon to be, it will be a requirement for certified lay ministers in their process as well. 
Another opportunity that we have for young people, and I'm really excited about it, it's a new one called Explore and Serve. It's for young people. It's going to be in August, and you will have the opportunity to go up to New York and help victims of the Sandy Hurricane. Those people up there still need help. And there will be a group of 20 who will be going up there to help on this mission trip. But in addition to that, not only will you be serving people on a mission, but you will also intentionally be taken to places in New York City and have special speakers come to you to help you in this discernment process to say, to help you with this question, God, what are your plans for me? For all of you who happen to be here at conference, we have a, a lady who is a professional curriculum writer. She works for a nationally known uh, Christian publication house. She has developed a curriculum which is going to be an on, it's going to be online. This is just for all of you who are at conference. You can come to our table and receive one of these or look in the link today. It will tell you how to sign up for this. If you can Google on the internet, you can do this. It is 10 days, maybe 15 minutes a day and you will have discussions with lots of people about what is God's plan for each and every one of us. It's an exciting opportunity for all of you. Exploration 2015 will be upon us shortly, and again, we will provide scholarship funds for young people to attend the National United Methodist Church Exploration. Not sure where it's gonna be yet, but I can promise you this. We'll provide your airfare to and back and it is an opportunity, and unlike anything else, if you're interested in finding out more about the ordained ministry, that's the place to go. We have a variety of other avenues and tools to help with this discussion and in your discernment process. I really encourage you, come on over to the ENI table during your breaks. All of the team would love to talk to you, gather your ideas, and let us share what we have, because together, I think it's really important that we wrestle with this question, God, what do you plan for me? Now, I have a pastor, and we're talking about leadership, and I have to bring this up. My pastor is what I would call a baseball fanatic. I don't know about John over here. He might be close to one, too. But uh, the pastor has always said that you can learn a lot from baseball if you're just open to it and you go and you look. Well, I'll tell you what. A couple weeks ago, my husband and I went to a baseball game first professional baseball game I've ever been to. I had a purpose. I watched 13 innings, and I don't know much about baseball, but 13 innings gave me an opportunity to sit there and reflect on the similarities between leadership in the church and baseball. And I want to share with you what I found out. Well, in baseball, they have a team. We have a church. Baseball, well, they have members of a team who have specific gifts and passions. They have a coach that recognizes how these gifts are, what they are, and how they can all work together. Now, if you really want a sidebar, read the book called The Closer. There's a man who never spoke English, didn't know who Babe Ruth was, much less Hank Aaron, never flew on a plane and had no clue that he was gonna be a professional pitcher, but signed a contract and came and did. Well, I think God is sort of like that in our lives. The church is a body of individuals called by God, given specific gifts, given specific uh, passions to come together to do God's work. But for some of those people, they don't have a clue what their gifts are. And that's where you and I have to help point out and say, lift them up, help them see, this is the God-given gift to pull together to do the work of the church. Well, what I noticed is that when I went to that baseball game, after tons of preparation and practice, the team left the dugout and went out to the playing field to win the game. Now, this was a professional game, and let me tell you, I think as many balls went back into the seats as went forward that way. I was shocked. Dodging balls was not something I was planning on, but I learned quick. But I heard and I saw that there are things called balls, there's things called fouls, there's things called errors, and there are things called strikes, and there's things called outs. 
but every inning, one after the other, it was midnight, people, and they still kept coming out in that playing field. Didn't make any difference what they did before. They kept coming out to that playing field. And you know what? At one point, when they had all the bases loaded, the wind was just right. The pitcher made that ball go just in that certain little area. And that bat, that bat with a magnetic force behind it struck that ball and you hear the really large crack. And that ball went out of this field, out, out, out. It was a home run. It was magnificent. Well, in all seriousness, people, I know the church can make strikes and outs and errors and fouls, just like that baseball team. But I also know that through God's amazing grace, each and every one of us can make home runs. We're in a world right now that's crying out. It's broken, it's hurting. And we have the opportunity to leave the dugout and go out in the playing field and bring the light of Christ. I take this seriously and I ask you to listen. Listen to a world that's broken. And when you leave here today, after these three days, take home to your church. Are you guys gonna get out of the dugout? and go out to the playing field. I'd like you to listen to this video from Willow Creek. It's called 10,000 Questions.
Church, we're part of the Susquehanna Conference. I, I read over there that they said that we're one church with many locations. Many of you have taught me what it means to walk in faith, to surrender to God, and to go out into the world, and to serve and to share the love of Christ. I'm humbled by some of the things I see and I hear within this conference. But I'm also humbled to say that it's a big world. 
And we all need to open ourselves up and say, God, here I am. What's your plan for me? Because I'm going to walk out in that, that playing field and be the light of Christ for someone out there. This annual conference, take home, take home what God's calling you to take home and open up the doors of your church. The world's out there crying and we've got the answers. I ask you to stand and join me now in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we are your broken people and you alone can do great things through us with your powers of transformation. We ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit, guide and direct us. Breathe into us your spirit, your wisdom, your courage, and the heart of Christ, that indeed we're willing to step into the playing fields of the broken world around us and share the light of Christ with all. In Christ's name, amen. A couple of things that are important for us to realize. Um, one is our responsibility as laity uh, in the local church. When we go back to our churches, it's, it's our responsibility to create a culture of call within our church. One question that we need to take back and ask our fellow church leaders is this. When was the last time our congregation sent someone to ministry. When was the last time that our congregation sent someone to ministry? If you can quickly name someone, that's great. That's fantastic. If you're struggling to name someone, or if it's been a while since that's happened, Carol and the Enlistment Interpretation Committee are available as a resource. And she had mentioned there's a table in Brubaker Hall that they have. And I'm sure she'll be here throughout conference that she'll be able to help you. And also your local pastor can lead you to resources. It's important for us to help create that culture of call in our local church. The other thing that, that Carol mentioned when she was drawing her analogy was it's important for us to realize we cannot play the game in the dugout. We cannot be in mission and ministry all the time in our church. We have to be outside of our church. And that's one of the things that our next presenter will be discussing in terms of how transformational lay people are called and raised up through equipping God's people. Our next presenter is Diane Kinesny. And yes, that name is probably familiar to you. Um, and I pronounced it, it's pretty complicated, but I did pronounce it fairly easy, like I've been pronouncing it all my life. Uh, in case you haven't figured out, Diane is the better half of the Kinesny couple. She's a teacher at the Williamsport Area School District. And at our home church of Williamsport First for the past 30 years, she's been in any number of, of leadership positions, everything ranging from bell choir to small group leader to Sunday school teacher to you name it, and, and she's done it practically. Um, she, this is her first year at annual conference as a, as a lay member to conference, and so this is all new to her, and, and she's reminding me of a number of things that I need to tell all you new folks also. So uh, please be patient with me as I try to get through some of those things too. During this past year, though, she co-facilitated one of the two pilot sessions of Equipping God's People, which she'll talk with you about now. Diane? Good morning. I am Diane Konezny, and even though John can say his name well, it took me a while to learn how to spell it, and I still have to think about it from time to time. Last year, the theme for the annual conference was Alive in Christ Together on a Journey of Faith, and this year the theme is Raising Up Transformational Leaders. If you went to one of Bishop Park's laity sessions this year, you would have noticed that there's a shift to us, the laity, asking us to be more outwardly focused, working on making shifts from being a member of a church to making disciples of Christ. 
Now, we are all leaders here, or we wouldn't be here. And I was asked to share with you the call that I received last August about becoming a leadership opportunity in the program called Equipping God's People. Maybe some of you have heard of this. Some lovingly call it EGP, and some will call it equipping. Last August, I got a phone call from my district superintendent, Beth Jones, and she asked me if I would consider co-facilitating this class with Pastor Tom Jones from Avis. And I told her that I would pray about it, and how fast did she need an answer back? And she says, um, in about 10 days? I went, oh, because if I didn't accept that position, she would need time to find someone else from there. So I immediately talked with John, and we began to pray. I called Pastor Janet Derwalker of my church, and I asked her to pray for me also with this decision. And I need to tell you that I struggled with this decision. The struggle was, how do I fit it all together? How do I make all the timing fit? So at that time, I was the Bell Choir director, and I thought, ooh, because the class was going to be on a Thursday night, and I had bell practice on a Thursday night. I'm like, this isn't going to work very well. So I immediately send out emails to everybody in the bell choir and saying, can you shift practice to maybe a Saturday, Sunday after church, another night of the week? And so I was trying to figure out how to manage all of this with all the time. And Wednesday nights were out because that was small group night. So that was a major conflict. Well, the next Sunday I went to church at First Church and Pastor Janet came and said, well, have you made your decision? And I said, no, I really don't have a complete answer yet. I always knew that I was going to teach the class. I just hadn't figured out how to put it all together and how it was all going to work. So we talked a little bit and she said that she would continue to pray for me. And I was really emotional that Sunday. And another member came up to me and she said, Diane, are you all right? And I went, no, I'm not. So she said, I'll pray for you too. And what made it hard was the fact that God was telling me to put something else on your plate. You have to take something off. So, yeah, it really was a hard decision. But what I want you to know is that when God asks you to do something, he may be saying you need to step out of something just to make sure you are following his call. So John and I decided to do a, a neighborhood visit from a, in another church on the way home that Sunday. So we went to Loyal Sock to Fax and Kenmar Church. We went in, we sat down, and the first song that they sang was hymn number 344. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's called, Lord, You Have Come to the Lake Shore. And I'd like to read the first and last verse for you with the refrains. Lord, you have come to the lake shore, looking neither for wealthy nor wise ones. You only ask me to follow humbly. O oh Lord, with your eyes you have searched me, and while smiling, you have spoken my name. Now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me. By your side, I will seek other seas. You who have fished other oceans, ever longed for by souls who are waiting, my loving friend, as thus you have called me. O oh Lord, with your eyes, you have searched me, and while smiling, have spoken my name. Now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me. By your side, I will seek other seas. Through that song, God spoke to me, and he gave me that answer that I was looking for. Music speaks to me. It may speak to you also. It may be a friend that's talking to you, or something he's asking you to read, or a prayer but we need to listen to what God is calling us to do. And I was called to leave my comfortable shore and move on with him. So that meant that I had to say I was resigning as Bell Choir Director, which kind of surprised my pastors because they expected me to drop my small group. And it's like, this is what God is asking me to do. 
Is God asking you to do something? Are you asked and being asked to become a leader in your church, in your local church, here on the conference level, or maybe on the global level? I would like to invite you to watch a video showing the class that I co-facilitated. You're going to hear from some of the people who attended the class and how it has impacted them. As it says there, uh, Tom Rayner and Eric Geiger define Simple Church as a congregation designed around a straightforward and strategic process that moves people through the stages of spiritual growth. Um, what do you think? Is that how you define Simple Church? I especially like when we do belief groups because then I'm learning from other churches. And it's that good about them. See real people telling us real things that are happening. Uh, I can read a book, and you know that's a church of 3,000 people doing that. How's my 75 people going to do that? But I hear that now with these other churches and, and talking with these other people. And it's, it's very valuable. This class is absolutely helping. We get to share. We, you know, we're reading. We get to look at our, our assignments and, and follow through. It's not something that you just come here and write and you talk a little bit, you leave, you say, oh, you know, this is what I'm learning, let's put it in the practice. So, yeah, it is helping me out. In Simple Church, you read about some companies and how they became simple companies. So we're going to be taking a look at just one of those companies. Um, there's Apple, there's Google, there's uh, Papa John's. We're going to be looking at Southwest Airlines. Um, I know for me, having attended the, the classes, um, it's been neat, um, I'm in school working on a degree in leadership, it's been neat to see the parallels between uh, the church and the secular world, if you will, in terms of leadership and, and how that approaches. Quick story, um, there was a gentleman in one of the churches I served previously who was a real, real history buff, and I don't believe that there's a pastor in the Susquehanna Conference that doesn't want to be a transformational leader. Um, and there are classes that we've had as pastors and as clergy to uh, help us become transformational leaders. Um, but we can have all of the classes and all of the training in the world, and if the folks sitting in the pews aren't on board with what it is mm -hmm. that we're trying to accomplish, all that training is for naught. I 
and it is a lady-led revolution, or a revitalization, however you want to say that. So they're there to try and revitalize their church and to support their pastors. They realize that it's a team effort. Even though this is going to be lady-led, the pastor is working with them, and they're going to try and get those conversations and things moving with their pastors. They have to take ownership of, of the change that they want to see in their church. Um, no longer can this be a chaplain style of ministry. This has to be a laity-led movement and ministry out there if we're going to affect any type of change. And if we're going to make disciples for Jesus Christ, for the transformation of the world. I think this class is going to make a difference for me personally. I think it's going to make a difference for our church. Um, I think our focus has been too much inward uh, on, on keeping the people in the church comfortable. And that may be what it was all about in the 50s, uh, but not anymore. It's not about that. It's about reaching people for Christ. And we need to be outward. We need to move our ministry out to the people that, that need the love of Christ. And this class is going to help us, I think, uh, do that. Coming to an equipping God's uh, people training anybody who's thinking about it. Uh, if you're on the fence, just do it. Um, I think they're going to take a, a lot of new things. Um, even if you think you know what it means to uh, to be a leader, if you've been a leader or if you've been in those types of positions, um, I think you can really get a lot more about um, you know, just learning ways to maintain that leadership, to stay fresh and excited about your leadership, uh, and to help other people gain that same excitement about what they're going to be so it's not a matter of, do I have time for this? Am I busy? It's a matter of priority. And how can we advance the cause of Christ if we don't first consider him a priority? of the class is to strengthen the leadership of laity in order to help congregations be more effective in making disciples and transforming our world. Its goal is to enhance your leadership development and to share those practical informations that you have and will be available to use those in your lives and the lives of your church. This is a sister program to the program your pastor may have taken called Pastoral Leadership Development. Equipping God's People covers the same topics and information as the pastors did. Some of the topics discussed are vision, the clear picture of where the church is going, mission, our call by God to make disciples, structure, how are we structuring our church to achieve that mission, evangelism, reaching out to new people for Christ, connecting, a clear process for development, growth, and helping new people belong. And it's focused outward, our involvement in our community, reaching out to others, and serving. If you're looking for something to help you strengthen your leadership in order to make your congregation be more effective and in making disciples and transforming our world, then you, or maybe others in your church, would want to think about taking Equipping God's People class. If you want to know more about the class, there's going to be an informational session on Friday during the lunch session in Boyer Hall, room 336. You'll hear more about the course, its purpose, the sessions. You'll hear from someone who has taken the course. You'll also hear from a pastor who will share about how people who were taking the course have grown in his church. There will be a time for questions and answers. And if you're not available to go to that session, I'll be glad to talk with you during the conference. There is a display table in Brubaker Hall. It's set up with information that you're welcome to pick up. You can contact your district superintendent for other information or the Growing Effective Churches office. As you heard on the video, this is a lady-led revitalization. Revitalizing a church is a team effort between laity and clergy. It's a church team effort. 
What is God asking you to do? Thank you. Thank you, Diane. As Diane reminded everybody, there will be a display over in Brubaker Hall, a table set up there that will have information, more information about that. Also, your district offices will be announcing uh, uh, where Equipping God's People is going to be held in your various districts across the conference. Uh, I know that it's being planned for each and every district. I know Williamsport, the Williamsport district alone is going to be having uh, three different courses in the fall because we have such a large area to cover. Uh, there'll be three, at least three different courses that will be offered there, and I'm sure all the other districts will be having other courses available. One of the things that we're looking at is to get that in information about where the courses are also on the conference website, and we hope to have that later on this summer. Our next presenter will be providing us an important information about the how the conference is ensuring a safe and fruitful ministry environment uh, through the conference response team. Betty Westlake Reist is a layperson and the spouse of Reverend Jerry Lee Reist. She has been a response team member for the last 14 years. She is a teacher of the Boundaries, Boundaries Training Level 2 and has had training with the Faith Trust Institute in Seattle, Washington and the National Commission on Status and Role of Women. Betty? Let me tell you one of the ways that God has asked me to serve the church, and that is through the clergy sexual misconduct response team. I am not here to clergy bash. In fact, I happen to admire clergy and the work that they do for the Church of Jesus Christ. That is one of the reasons I am part of the work of the response team. Let me introduce you to that work. We have a twofold mandate. One, we are a team of volunteers, both clergy and lay, who help churches deal with the after effects of clergy sexual misconduct. Two, we are also involved in the work of misconduct prevention through the boundaries training of both clergy and laity. Let me start with the boundaries training. All elders, deacons, local pastors, certified lay ministers, and others who are in pastoral roles are required to go undergo two levels of boundaries training. You as lay persons are also welcome to attend. Being a minister is different from every other profession. Clergy help people deal with some of life's most challenging and intimate situations. Boundaries training can help them figure out how to help others while still maintaining a professional relationship. On to the second part of the response teamwork. What is clergy sexual misconduct? Sexual misconduct or abuse happens when someone in a ministerial role clergy or lay, engages in sexual contact with a congregant who is not their spouse. It may include sexual touch, prolonged hugging, kissing on the lips, inappropriate gifts, or sexual intercourse. Sexual misconduct may also be verbal, such as repeated innuendos, suggestive comments, sexual jokes, or questions about personal intimate relationships. When there is a formal charge of sexual misconduct, the pastor is immediately removed from their position in the church. This causes great upheaval and confusion within the church. Many people don't know what to think or do. Some folks are shaken to the point that they question their faith in the church and God. The response team is then called into action. The response team is not involved in the investigation of, of the charges or in disciplinary actions taken in response to the charges. Support persons or advocates are assigned to the minister and another to the clergy spouse. 
Support persons are also assigned to the victim and their spouse. Support persons or advocates may also be assigned to others in the church who may have been affected, such as the SPRC chair or the church secretary. Advocates walk the person through the process. They do not judge or make decisions concerning that person. Next, the team goes to the church for a congregational meeting. We meet with the SPR, SPCR about how they are doing as church how they as the church leadership are doing. Following that is a gathering of the entire congregation. We start with a short worship service. The team will then take questions from the group as a whole, and then we split up into small breakout groups so that everyone has a chance to talk. If youth are especially affected, we have persons trained to work with them. We can reconvene to answer any questions that may have come up in the small groups. We have no magic cure. Most of what we do is listen and help church members to listen to each other. Each person is allowed and encouraged to speak about their feelings. We reassure folks that even though their pastor has engaged in sexual misconduct, that does not mean that other aspects of the pastor's ministry were not valid or sincere. Yes, your experience may be that your pastor was great when you had a family crisis. You should honor and celebrate that. You may also be one who has experienced the misconduct. Your experience is also valid. You have received a pamphlet and a bookmark about sexual misconduct in the church. Take these back to your church with you. If you or someone you know are a victim of misconduct or abuse by someone in a ministerial role, please let us know so that we can help. On the back of both the pamphlet and the bookmark is contact information. I will be around after this session if you wish to speak to me. If you cannot find me in the crowd, you can leave a message at the conference desk with your contact information. I would also encourage you to read the conference sexual ethics policy, which can be found on the conference website at susumc.org. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. A couple of things to keep in mind in, in terms of what Betty brought forward. Uh, one is in terms of that this is, this is a group of volunteers that are acting as advocates, that they feel strongly enough about this, passionate about it, and this is a calling that they have as well. And it's just one of the many activities and teams and groups that are involved in the day-to-day -day mission and ministry of the Susquehanna Annual Conference. We'll be talking a little bit more about leadership opportunities during the nominating committee portion of the plenary sessions. But we wanted to highlight not only these opportunities, but also sometimes the struggles that folks go to, go through whenever they're called to a new leadership activity. The other thing that, that Betty had brought up is, is, is bringing this out into the open so that we are all aware of this because through education, we're hoping to prevent situations from occurring, but also that you realize that these situations are not swept under the rug, but they are dealt with effectively and quickly by the conference. 